For our next speaker, uh, she does not have this advantage. She is exemplary of grassroots activism because her commentary on the socio-political ramifications of religion ring out like a lone voice in her own country. Mm -hmm. Please welcome someone who I consider to be a personal friend and oh, I am very Ooh. proud and proud to introduce all the way from Romania, Christina Rad. So oh my God, it's great. Everybody's been so nice to me here. I don't know. I'm suspicious. <laughs> I'm fearing I'm about to be pranked or something. It's really surreal. So my name is Kristina Rad. I'm from Romania, and uh, I'm a vlogger, which is honestly not nearly as lame as it sounds. Really. Three years ago and it was mostly out of frustration because being an atheist in Romania can be pretty depressing at times. This is how things were in my country some 10 years ago. This was the 2002 census and as you can see the vast majority of the population, some 85% identified as Christian Orthodox, around 5% Protestant, some other 5% Catholic, some 3% belong to other religions, uh, Islam, Greek Catholics, some other smaller weird cults. But the interesting is that the people who did not identify with any religion did not even make for 1% of the population. Not even close. As you can see, there's an impressive percentage of 0.1 of people with no declared religion. As for those who identified as atheists, the percentage is so small you cannot even see it on the chart. I tried to make it visible, I couldn't. It's 0.04%. We don't have the results for the 2011 census yet. I hope things have improved in the last 10 years. I'm just not overly optimistic. There is a huge change. So you may understand why being an atheist in my country, especially an open atheist, is a challenge that can make one seek refuge to the wonderful world of the internet. Because in real life, if you try to share your thoughts with other people as an atheist, you will most likely be viewed as misguided in the best case, or you know, walk through some phase, I cannot tell you how many times I heard that, or deluded, which is ironic, <laughs> and in the worst case as a messenger of Satan. So basically this is the reason why I started making videos. Now those of you who may be familiar with my YouTube channel, well, first of all, I'm sorry, you must be a bit traumatized. <laughs> but you may know that a lot of the times I do discuss religion. And one thing that I keep on hearing over and over again is, why do I bother? Why can't I just let people believe whatever they want to believe? Why do I even care? And the honest truth is that I wouldn't care. I mean, as long as your beliefs don't impact the society in a negative way, it's really none of my business. If you want to believe that the supernatural entity who created the entire universe is now concerned with whether or not you work on Sabbath, you can go right ahead. And same if you believe that rectal probing green little men from our space are out to get you, or that the planet's gonna fall on top of your head at the end of this December. Or of course, that there's a unicorn castle at the end of the rainbow. I mean, just because I personally find these ideas ridiculous, I really wouldn't be bothered if this was all there was to them. I mean, in my country, people believe that throwing rice at the newlyweds will help them have children. I don't know if you have the same custom here. And, you know, personally, I think there are more productive ways to get pregnant. If that's what you mean. And those methods are a lot more fun, quite frankly. But, you know, if this is what you want to believe, why should I care, right? But you see, the problem is that very often people's beliefs influence their actions. And their actions affect, to some degree, everything around them. I oppose homeopathy not because I just find it silly, but because there are people who see it as a replacement for real medicine and use it as such. And in the same way, conspiracy theories may seem funny. They really are. Until you see these people militating against flu vaccination for children under the claim that it causes autism and other people buying into that. 
As for religious beliefs, they may seem benign too, until you see them take over social secular values. This is why we are still discussing reproductive rights. This is why we are still discussing if religion should be taught in schools along with science. And this is why we are rarely discussing euthanasia rights for people with terminal illnesses who sometimes literally beg for it. The unfortunate reality is that in the 21st century, religion is still shaping the world we live in. And if religion remains unchallenged, then so are all the social problems that come with it. Including the fact that in most parts of the world, some people still don't have the legal right to get married because of their sexual orientation. Which is quite ironic to say the least, considering that people justify this legal inequality with a book that tells you it's okay to have relations with your siblings. You may remember Abraham married his sister Sarah, plus apparently all of us, the homo sapiens species, are here because Cain and Abel had sex with their sisters. And it's also okay to have relations with your children. You may remember that Lot impregnated both of his daughters. Because, I don't know, I guess a man's gotta do what a man's gotta do and his wife gets turned into salt. <laughs> You're also free to have sex with your slaves, like Abraham, again. With your rape victims, who have to marry their rapist. With 700 woodmen at once, like King Solomon. I can only imagine what a handful that was. <laughs> and even with little girls, once of course you kill their families and destroy their homes and all that. So all of that is fine and dandy, however, relations between two legal consenting adults of the same gender are just very, very wrong. This is 2012, and we live in an age where we do have an international declaration of human rights, which states that all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. And any politician who doesn't want to commit career suicide will agree that, yes, we should all be equal under the law, except for those goddamn queers. <laughs> Because homosexuality is so unnatural. No, it's not. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna keep this picture up for a while because I like it. <laughs> Because I know there are people who, even though may share these views, they tend to shy away from criticizing something as widespread and deep-rooted as religion. Because when you do that, you are bound to offend people. There is this general notion that we must respect people's beliefs no matter what we think about them. And I couldn't disagree more with this. I don't see why any system of beliefs deserves respect simply because it exists. If there were certain groups of people, and trust me, there are, I have been arguing with them, who believe that some people are inferior to others because they have a different skin color, would you feel automatically inclined to respect that? Then why should religion be any different? If we want to see anything improve, we need to get over these social taboos, because ignoring facts will not make any problems go away. And the fact is this, that about 70% of the world population lacks religious freedom right now. We do need to talk about this if we hope to change anything because freedom of religion and freedom from religion are fundamental rights that everybody should have. And I know that some of the material I post on my channel does offend and upset people sometimes. For instance, some two years ago I made a little satire skit where I impersonated Muhammad He's the prophet of Islam, you may have heard of him. <laughs> and what I did, I proposed a drastic reform in the Sharia law. So this is part of that video where I am Muhammad. If we get it to play. If someone somewhere says or does something you disagree with, making death threats is not a viable option for you to argue your points. You see, making death threats, or in the worst case, going through them, is not really the best method to defend what you call a religion of peace. Think about it. All women deserve the same respect that men do, regardless if they choose to wrap themselves in garbage bags or not. <laughs> um, burkas. Yeah, burkas. Now, I know this may come as a bit of a shock to you, but as a universal rule that applies to any circumstances you may think of, women are not the property of men and should not be considered as such. Ever. Beheading, stoning, hanging, cutting of limbs, flogging, and any other such types of physical punishments are from now on strictly prohibited. Consensual sex between adults is not a crime and there should be no legal penalties for it. 
regardless if it happens outside of marriage or between people of the same gender or whatever other sexual acts you may not like and therefore wish to punish. The same goes for apostasy, blasphemy, and whatever else involves people's freedom of speech that again you may not like and therefore wish to punish. I said before that in my lifetime I made some messed up mistakes and that includes <clears throat> having a six-year-old wife, but I'm not... Well, I'm doing this all wrong. <laughs> anyway, you get the message behind it. I'm not gonna keep on playing it. Um, I don't know the sound, I think there was a sound problem, but I think you got the main idea. So that was a satire, and this may come as a bit of a shock, but my proposals were not very popular among practicing Muslims. <laughs> I don't know why. But the thing is, not only Muslims, because I know that even some non-believers were offended by those clips. I've noticed an increased sensitivity among non-believers when criticizing not so much religion in general, but particularly Islam. And to some extent I can at least try to understand this, because there are several things I think one should take into consideration when discussing Islam. Things that are a non-issue when you address, for instance, Christianity. Like the fact that in the Western culture, Muslims represent a small minority, and like it tends to happen with most minorities, they are subjected to religious bigotry and discrimination. And at the same time, the vast majority of Muslims here in the West are not white. And in a society, again, with a largely predominant white population, they are also sometimes subjected to racism. Last February, the ICNA Relief, which is an American Muslim relief organization, held an event in California to raise money for a women's shelter. And what happened was that hundreds of people showed up to protest this event. Again, the event was raising money for women's shelter. And including elected officials spoke at this protest, who, by the way, was organized by groups such as the local Tea Party and the North Orange County Conservative Coalition. You may have be familiar with those groups, they are wonderful indeed. And if you've seen these images already, this is just a reminder of what was going on. I'm really bad at this, I'm sorry. <laughs> Here we go. I remember that one.
And while this may look witty at first glance, it's wrong on so many levels. Yes, there is social pressure on women in the West too. And yes, we definitely need to work on that. However, think about what would happen if these two women would change outfits for a day. For the sake of the argument, let's say that the woman on the right is from the United States and the other woman is from Saudi Arabia. What would be the reactions on the street if the woman on the right would decide to wear a burqa all of a sudden? Some people staring maybe? Worst case scenario, somebody may shout something rude? What about the other woman? What would happen if she decided to appear on the streets of Saudi Arabia wearing something revealing? Well, anything could happen to her. And I mean literally anything, from being beaten, raped, or even killed. So how is this even comparable? We've been witnessing recently that Western countries, more and more of them, are starting to allow the function of Sharia courts, which is something that I vehemently oppose. I'm 100% behind Mariana Messi's demand to have one secular law for all citizens, and oppose faith-based laws. laws are always completely arbitrary and discriminatory. And one of the main counter-arguments I keep on hearing is that Sharia courts in the West are only limited to civil matters. To which I say, yeah, civil matters, which are at the very basis of discrimination, especially against women and children. By allowing Sharia courts to function, we are declaring that religious principles should have legal authority, legal authority over things like child custody, divorce, inheritance, domestic violence, these are issues dealt with by Sharia courts in the West right now. How the hell did this came to be? And another argument was, well, we already have Jewish courts of law, so then what's wrong with Sharia courts? And to me, this sounds like saying, well, cancer is not that bad. I mean, we already have AIDS. <laughs> I don't think religion, any religion, should be incorporated in state laws, period. I guess my idea of progress is, fixing the bad things and not adding new bad things on top of them. Maybe I'm just crazy. <laughs> and just to put it out there, I'm not against the idea of multiculturalism. I mean, I would actually be happy to see, for instance, a museum of anthropology next to a Baptist church, next to, I don't know, a mosque, next to a gay bar. <laughs> I think that would be awesome. <laughs> What I'm saying is that religion should have absolutely no say in illegal matters and that we should not tolerate abuse and discrimination in the name of multicultural harmony. And having said all this, while I do understand that people tend to be more cautious when addressing what, what is in their society a minority, I think that by keeping silent, this means ignoring another minority, an even smaller one, which is the ex-Muslims. The people who denounced Islam and had the courage to do it publicly and who are now suffering the consequences with very little help from anybody. In Islam they say that once you're a Muslim you'll always be one and that the so-called ex-Muslims were never real Muslims to begin with. And while the Muslim communities welcome with open arms all the new converts, hell has seen no fury when somebody becomes an apostate. I cannot tell you how many messages I get from people who insist to remain anonymous because of fear, Muslims questioning their religion, or even ex-Muslims who cannot come out because they would be ostracized from their communities and their families would turn their backs on them, and in some cases because they legitimately fear for their lives. And on the other hand, there are these people, if we can play the video a bit. These are the people who had the courage to come out with their faces and real names, who publicly denounced Islam and are now speaking against it. These people showed that it can be done, that this is a growing movement, that criticizing Islam and renouncing Islam should not be taboo. But the thing is, they need our help too. And by the way, all these pictures and names were used with permission. They were sent to me by people who are Islam apostates and open about it despite their social consequences, they are probably likely to have suffered from their communities. <laughs> and the rights of are for them, not for myself, because they are, they are indeed courageous. And 
Now, I want to step away a little bit from the subject of religion because this is not the only thing we are discussing as skeptics and atheists, right? This is what we say. I want to talk about a completely different subject. And I'm sorry if changing subjects like this may be confusing, but I really want to talk about this too because I don't get to do this, this so often. I'm First of all, I think it would be redundant to talk about cannabis because I'm sure the vast majority of you do not oppose legalization. I'm sure of that. But just to get a feel of the audience, I would just like to know how many of you think that consumption of hard drugs should remain illegal. And we are talking about things like cocaine, heroin, and so on. So if you think the consumption of hard drugs should remain illegal, just raise your hand so I get an idea. Okay, quite a few of you. Okay. I hope that I will manage to sway you a little bit by the end of this. Because the war of drugs has been systematically proven to be a complete failure. And yet we continue to invest billions of dollars in it and put in prison millions of people for victimless crimes. And just to make things clear, I don't condone or encourage the use of hard drugs. I don't like hard drugs. And I hate what they do to people probably just as much as you do. However, prohibition is not the answer. Since we started this war on drugs, the black market practically exploded. And with it, so did a number of drug-related problems. The United States spent an estimate of $15 billion in 2010 alone on the war on drugs. The United Nations Office on Drug and Crimes estimates that globally the drug trade is worth around $320 billion a year. And despite this money invested in the war on drugs, and despite interventions at every single point in the supply chain, drug consumption has been rising, prices have been falling, and access to drugs has become easier. Also, the number of people sentenced to prison has increased exponentially. This is a chart of the world leading jailers. You may see that oh, the United shit, States is the front runner there, followed by Russia and South Africa. I don't think it's a reason to brag about. Europe is not that bad, however, it's getting worse, which again is a problem. And now if you look at the chart of federal prisoners in the United States, you can see that the number of prisoners convicted for drug-related crimes far exceeds the number of people incarcerated for violent crimes. Anyone else is a problem with that chart? Also, this chart here is showing the increasing number of prisoners since Nixon declared the war on drugs and since the Sentencing Reform Act. And if you look at it, it pretty much speaks for itself. Now, I don't know about you, but personally, I feel guilty we are contributing with income tax money to keep these people in jail. And in some cases, we take them out of college. This happens. We throw them in an environment with real criminals. We destroy their lives. We take away their future. And for what? These people need help, if anything, not punishment, not jail time. As for decriminalizing <laughs> This method, unlike the war on drugs, has actually been proven to work. In 2001, Portugal decriminalized the use and possession of all illicit street drugs. And that includes marijuana, LSD, cocaine, heroin, all of them, no exception. Basically, they removed all criminal penalties for personal possession and consumption of narcotics no matter where they occur or for what purpose. And they adopted this method in the face of a growing number of drug-related problems, like the increasing HIV deaths linked to drug consumption and so on. And prior to 2001, Portugal had some of the highest levels of hard drug use in Europe. So what they did was replace jail time with the offer of free therapy treatment. And surprise, surprise, as it turns out, incarceration is actually more expensive than treatment. Also, implementing prevention programs works better than hunting down drug users. Who would have thought? Only five years later, decriminalization has proven to be a success. For kids of ages 13 to 15 and 16 to 18 years old, drug consumption rates have actually decreased, 
Now you may theorize about the reasons behind this. Maybe these substances seem a lot more attractive to kids when they are illegal, or maybe because prevention programs are doing their job, maybe there are other reasons, a combination of them. But the fact is that for these two critical groups of youth, who are the focus of the concern, prevalence rates have declined for virtually every substance since decriminalization. Also, the number of newly reported cases of HIV and AIDS among drug addicts has declined substantially every year since 2001. Drug-related mortality rates have decreased as well, and the number of, of people seeking treatment has more than doubled in just five years. As for the pessimistic predictions that Portugal could become an oasis for drug-using tourists, or that the number of young drug users will increase overnight, none of that happened. This idea that decriminalizing drugs will bring on, I don't know, the much-anticipated zombie apocalypse or something is baseless. So please don't fall victim to these scare tactics, because with the current economic situation, we cannot afford to throw billions of dollars out the window with absolutely no results, as it is happening right now. Perspective, we cannot afford to throw our youth in jail and turn them into criminals when they never harmed anybody, especially when help is more productive and less expensive than punishment. This is all I have for you today. Thank you very much. You've been wonderful.